It's time for Class Racing Today, the podcast for the NHRA Class Racing fan. Welcome back to Class Racing Today. This milestone episode, uh, episode 50, classracingtoday.com is the website if you want to help support the show. Don't forget that you can directly help support the show with donations. Uh, we have a couple people we want to thank for their support. Uh, James Carter and Don Turk, we appreciate their support of the show. Uh, if you want to help sponsor the show, you can send us an email, uh, classracingtoday at gmail.com. Uh, and we would love to talk to you about that. Um, it's been a couple weeks since we had people in studio. Uh, Brian, you're back with us again um, off the road. I know, and you brought cold weather with you. I thought you were running away from the cold. What happened? Um, I just like to run. <laughs> sometimes to the cold, sometimes <laughs> away from it. <laughs> Trying to, uh, you know, it really doesn't matter like where you go. The cold seems to follow. So there's a big ice storm coming through Texas, so that'll be interesting. That'll be Oh, uh, an- a a, another uh, snowmageddon. Yeah. Oh, and Bobby, you, Bobby, well. you guys had uh, some crazy recently. And you're crazy weather woods. and, yeah, crazy situations um, in the Fazio household. But, yeah, everybody, uh, I thank everybody for reaching out. That was really, really nice. The support was overwhelming. My father uh, did have a heart attack. Uh, I was in town visiting that day, so it just... It was amazing that I had to happen to be there. I got him to the ER without wasting much time, and he's on the road to recovery. That's awesome. Right now, he had a successful open heart surgery, and we uh, we couldn't be you know happier about that situation. So, thank you, God, and thank you all uh, of the uh, class racing family that reached out to us. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's incredible that you happened to be there that day. Good work. I did my best. You know, I used my racing skills to get to that <laughs> ER. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Did you do any red lights? <laughs> yeah. I was I was negative on a couple of reaction times. Let's just say that and nobody was uh thank God there was no cops on the road. <clears throat> yeah. That's uh we're we're glad. That's pretty cool the racing community. I mean in general, I don't know how many texts and messages like how's Bobby's dad? How's Bobby's dad? And it's just really cool that it's uh I never thought when we started this podcast that it would actually reach so many people in kind of develop a community so i guess that's kind of a side effect that's not really what i thought was going to happen but it's just really kind of neat how caring and supportive the whole stock super stock community is so i want to thank all of our listeners like you guys are are the reason why we do this i guess that's what makes it fun for me definitely and to have 50 episodes under our belt now i'm i'm not sure we ever thought it was gonna i don't know last that long and it's it's getting more fun each each week, so today we have a great episode. Well, in store. And, and, and you're getting ready to tuck this one under your belt. It's not there yet. You better nail it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually. Uh, goes <laughs> I'm thinking about going south and going racing. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to yet. I got to get it past the war department, but Bell Rose sounds like kind of a neat place, and I don't know to be determined. I guess. Well, I'm sure everybody would love to see you out there, so I'm I'm rooting for you. Go go down there, get out of that cold weather that you live in, and head south. I don't know if you'll get in the Gator Nationals though. The problem um, is, is every time I like, so I ran down to Texas, Alabama on a little road trip here, and it was 26 degrees when I got like rolled into Georgia. It was 26 degrees, and everybody's hoses froze. And I'm like, I hope they don't realize that I brought it with me because it was 17 below when I left my house. So. Hopefully I'm gone. I'm no longer in Texas, and it's going to be cold and nasty this week, so it was not my fault. But if I come to Bell Rose and the Holtz wake up to 20-degree weather, I'm probably going to get, like, <laughs> strung up. Oh, my but goodness. But, hey, the margaritas will be uh, way easier to keep cold. And uh, yeah. Oh, the greatest thing that happened to me in a long time. I got to talk about this. <laughs> I got into Lupe Tortillas. Ooh. The Fort Worth location. So I've tried like six times to get in there, and there's always been like a two-hour wait. So I'm telling these friends I'm with, oh, man, this place is awesome, and it has the, the best owners in the world. Like, they're just, Sheila and Stan are just awesome people. And we pull up there, and there's like two cars in the parking lot. <laughs> they're like, maybe they're not open. Like, you're so <laughs> full of crap. We walked in there, and oh, my gosh, just the most amazing food I've ever had. Who thought you would go to 
a Mexican style restaurant for ribs, but I strongly suggest. So the father of one of the gentlemen I was with, <clears throat> he's pretty much a steak and mashed potatoes. If he's crazy, he'll go mashed potatoes. Otherwise, it's a baked potato. Like every meal, that's all he eats. And he's like, I'm just going to have the margaritas. <laughs> he wasn't going to eat because he couldn't read anything on the menu. I'm like, we'll get you ribs to try it. And they bring out like a mountain of ribs, and he's just mowing them down, and he wanted to go back. So it was really cool. Uh, Stan Sheila, I know that's your, not necessarily your restaurant, it's your restaurants, but your sons are doing a good job of carrying on your name. I can't wait to go to the original now. So I'll get off my soapbox, but Team Lupe Tortilla, I'm forever yours. How about that? Now I have to try it. So hopefully this year I can get down there. Stan and Sheila, they're probably out there listening. Sheila's always listening. Ribs, of all things. Unbelievable. Oh, absolutely amazing. Everything was amazing. Like, they literally had to roll me out of there. Like, <laughs> I had to, like, unbutton my pants to get in the truck. Like, it was really sad. Like, I thought it was a Thanksgiving meal. Did they give you Lupe Tortilla stickers to put on the car, and now you're... Uh... Entered in their contingency program, which is what a free meal at any uh, location for a win or runner up. That would be an all that'd be an all right program, wouldn't it? I like it. We can ask today's guest all about it. Maybe we can get them signed up. What do you think? I guess you don't think too highly of it. I think it's a great idea. Like, uh, anyways, today about... we get. Yeah, no, I was asking Brian what he thought. He's the one that actually tried it out. So, today's guest we have David Kennedy, NHRA's head of the contingency program, as well as the the head of multimedia content. David was kind enough to uh, set me up with an interview at the PRI show a couple months back. I uh, got interviewed by Tony Pedragon. We talked about class racing and class racing today, and that was really cool. So, David Kennedy, how you doing, sir? Good morning, gentlemen. How are you guys? Good morning, Class Racing uh, podcast listeners. So, David, you're joining us from the West Coast. It is yep. 7 o'clock in the morning out there. Sure, but it's it's 53 degrees. I know, I know we're talking about being cold today, so here, here it's nice and warm for me by, by comparison. And warm, warm and early and warm, and here it's like midday and still cold. So I, yeah. I guess, you know, I would, I would trade with you in a heartbeat. Yeah. Well, again, I appreciate you having me on and giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, things that are important to all of us, So, including some food. Now I'm hungry. Now I'm ready for some breakfast. So. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Brian. So let's get into it. We're going to start with the contingency sure. program. Um, first off, we all, you know, this this contingency program is is essential to sportsmen racers. And I, and I would assume, you know, maybe to the pros as well, because they, they get a little, uh, they get some thrown at them. Um, but without this contingency program, it's really not – it's not worth it for, for sportsman racers to race. This is our bread and butter. You know, when you, yeah. you win an event, that sticker money is huge. So how's it looking for 2022? You know, do we get any new sponsors coming in? Is there any new interest in the program? What can you tell us? Sure. So you're absolutely right. And, and contingency program is one of NHRA's oldest programs. So by my records, it dates back to the mid-60s. And so it's, it's been around longer than all of us. And it's the type of thing that has been helping racers come back and, and do what they love doing uh, every week. And it's the same thing that, uh, you know, it's, it's basically a merger of, uh, of manufacturers and racers. You know, it, it kept manufacturers from having to figure out who to sponsor, uh, who to give product to. And then around the nation, you know, how, how do they track who actually won, won with their stuff and, uh, and, and broadcast and shared uh, that success with decals and presence. So uh, any trade contingency program is basically really that is mixing the success of the racers and the manufacturers together. Uh, in 2022, good news is it's going to grow about 20% this year. Uh, for you guys at the divisional level, it's going to grow more so at the national event for sports and racers than it will at the divisional level. And we'll get into that and explain why that happens. Um, but there, there's a rationale that I think everybody can understand and, and reach into. And then the good news is that, uh, again, coming through COVID, we learned a lot of things that had to be modernized and updated because the program uh, was probably more like it was in 1966 than it needed to be. And so it needed to be modernized like that. And uh, we've made a lot of strides there. So I'm, I'm grateful to be able to talk, talk a little bit about that to make it both easier for the racer and easier for the manufacturer. Uh, but we just had to do some uh, tremendous amount of work inside to get that 
right. And I can talk a little bit more about some of the things we're doing to make it easier going forward too. Well, yeah, that, that's actually, you know, we can, we can kind of start there. I'm, I was fortunate enough to finally win a national event recently yep. and that was September 12th. So we're talking four or five months. I don't know how many months now, and I'm still waiting for some checks to roll in, still sure. emailing manufacturers. They're still sending paper checks. They're using paper. They're using stamps. One manufacturer accidentally sent my check down to Puerto Rico. Like, why the hell are we still doing that? Why isn't this like a quick, like, here's my information, direct deposit, like, let's go. Why does this have to be so kind of like drawn out and slightly ridiculous, if I may? Well, and, and I think because of the nature of, of this type of program, because it's kind of almost like a cooperative, so every company's personality uh, every every accounts payable department factors into this, but you know inherently also it's we want we want to keep it a cash program because we want the racers to have uh, the liquidity of whatever they need to buy to get to that next race. Uh, they have that resource, and so one of the things that we work with our partners, uh, the manufacturers, is to is to keep these cash payments for racers so that in some cases you might need to buy fuel, in some cases you might need to buy tires, and that. You know, that basically means staying in their accounts payable, getting a check uh, so that they can track their cash out uh, versus their cash in. So it is, uh, it does vary from department to department. There are some companies that will send you a, a basically a, a cash card that they'll recharge. Um, so there's not a paper check mailed. You know, the W9 aspect that I think a lot of racers can relate to, uh, that also is a requirement so that they can keep track of payments made uh, for their tax purposes and expenses. But but inherently, um, you know, again, the way the way the program is, maybe we can even start there. You know, it's fundamentally uh, there's more than a hundred and I think right now there's probably 115 uh, product postings from about 85 manufacturers, and these manufacturers are brands you know that everybody knows their household names, and then there are some that are mom and pop racers. Um, shops, you know, companies that know they want to use their relationships with other racers to uh, expand the, the success of, the, of their sales. So there's two successes that are involved, the racer success and the manufacturer success. Um, when both those groups win, when, when you go down the track and you end up in the winner's circle or runner up, you know, that, that success is going to be shared. And that success should mean other people looking at your car and saying what transmission you're running, what axle you're running, uh, you know, what, what fuel pump are you running? And if that's working for Bami, then then it's probably going to work for me too. So that idea of that early, it's, it was an influencer marketplace before that term was ever even used. And again, I think a lot of it is uh, successful because of it's relatively simple. Um, the companies, let's talk about the companies that's come into this type of uh, this marketplace. For a long time, this is the only way to market to fellow racers, word of mouth and, and racetracks. If you wanted to see the latest and greatest products, you literally had to go and see what, what other racers were running. And in many cases, what they were running, they kept the hoods closed and they weren't talking about what parts they were running. Um, so contingency program early on allowed manufacturers to say, okay, the success you're having, put decal outside of the car. You're gonna tell people what kind of, uh, what kind of transmission you have. We can tell people what kind of camshaft you have. And we're gonna make it worth your while to kind of give up your secret by paying you for that uh, when you win and runner up by sending you a check. Early on, it was money handed over literally in the winter circle. You know, and then again, that's where it kind of starts with the cash program. Today, it's checks in the mail. Um, it, there are companies that will do digital payments, and we are working on doing that uh, and trying to help companies make those payments easier across the board. Because anything we can do uh, to make things easier, it works well for us. Fundamentally, I should insert for NHRA. We see it the same way you do. This is not a profit center for NHRA. This is a success center. Because we know if you win money, we know what you can do with that money. You're going to come racing again. And every quarter mile pass you can make on any NHRA member track in any town, that's good for NHRA drag racing. Um, and we know what the companies are going to do. When you succeed with their products, they're going to see a viable marketplace. They're going to see more products being sold. They're going to see drag racing as a, as a place to invest and do an R&D and, and making products better. So you know, it, it, it takes care of both sides. And... Uh, and for fans and people wanting to watch racing, um, it also allows you to kind of say, all right, what, what's what's working and what should I be paying attention to? Because uh, it allows another layer of understanding of, of the hardware that's happening. So if if it's a success center and you hit up, we want to make this as easy as possible. Um, 
by and large, the companies that have participated are the same year over year and have been, I would estimate, for the last decade. That's good. That shows the the longevity of this program. It shows the success of this program. Uh, The partners that we have, it's the only entity within NHRA that that probably works for, if if you had a torque converter company or you were working on torque converters, Bobby, you could post. And General Motors is going to post next to you. So it's a grassroots program that works for the individual that and it also works for an auto manufacturer, um, and that's that kind of scale is hard. To, it's hard to create a program that does uh, works with both, but um, it it also is generally the entry level uh, for the, what a lot of manufacturers and, and marketing partners coming in. So we keep the door open. Uh, so program, if you want to post, if you want to be participant in this from a manufacturer standpoint, we'll start there. It can be free. It can be free to you to come in. Um, if you are an auto manufacturer, a camshaft manufacturer, a lug nut manufacturer, you want to be a participant in the NHRA contingency program, no fee it from the NHRA to you. You come in the first year and you tell us, these are the products I have I want to post for. What well, classes make sense? Uh, we're going to try to get you in as many classes as a manufacturer that makes sense to you. And you're going to post, uh, again, the sports level, $300 to win, $100 to runner up. Uh, at the national events, at a divisional event, $100 to win, $50 to run or up. That's kind of the baseline. When you come in, you have success in the sports and classes. And again, that's where we're going to target you. Uh, you're going to then look at in the following year of coming in and saying, well, let me post at the divisional level. You get access to more racers for the 44 divisional events. Uh, with that does come a fee. It comes a fee of $1,000. That $1,000 allows that manufacturer of lug nuts, in this case, we'll use this example, to display and uh, enter all 44 divisional races across the country. So that money goes to the division directors to help them, you know, with staff for parking space, display space, and basically admission to all those divisional events. All right. So let's let's stop you. Can I stop you right there then? So you're saying if a new manufacturer, if I come in and I'm manufacturing lug nuts, I can enter the national event contingency posting for free. For free. And just post, you know, my 300 win, 300 or 100 runner up to as many classes as I want without giving NHRA any money at this time. Yeah. The only thing we should specify, uh, it would be the 300 to win, $100 to runner up for sports and racing at the national event level. So the 22 national events we'll have this year. Absolutely. Right. At the national. Yeah. So then they have the option, then the second year you're saying to post at the national. Is that still free again or do they have to pay for that? It stays free. And, and they could continue, and, and many of our participating companies post at this complimentary or free level, and you can stay there forever if you want as a manufacturer. Okay, and then for the divisional levels, they have to pay you $1,000 for the year or per race? $1,000 for the year, and okay. that cost is, again, effectively to allow for some parking space and allow for divisional level resource um, so that they can have uh, a little bit more staffing and a little bit more uh of, of all the things that you when you, you know when you go to a divisional race um it's it's always we could always use more at, at the at the local level yeah right um, so th- and then that idea of uh that's a, that's a lot of tickets that's a lot of parking spaces and uh that that fee again helps access uh, all those events um but if you were coming in as a new partner uh, i would make sure you were having success success paying racers success getting your decals out uh success selling your products and in the first year, that's why we would start to the complimentary level, uh, because we want to make sure you were having that success, make sure we weren't opening up to too much uh, before you, you could handle it. And uh, again, there's some there's some companies that stay at that that participation level uh, for year over year. Where do you go beyond that? Now back to the national events. Where do you go beyond that complimentary level? So the the three t- the three tiers are you come in a complimentary, and when that works for you, and you're posted at the national event level. And you can post for everything from top fuel uh, to factory stock. Again, no fee uh, from the NHRA, not in the beginning, not at the end. Um, the only money you're going to pay is going to go from manufacturer to racer. Uh, NHRA is going to be aware of the payment scenarios. So when you as a racer say, uh, I want and I haven't received a check from product X or manufacturer Y, uh, we're going to know the scenario. We're going to know you won. We're going to know uh, what you should have been entitled to. And, and we're going to track that with our own internal systems um it basically means that we can know when we need to help uh help uh, a manufacturer facilitate a payment that we can say you know that all the requirements have been met um this this racer should uh, is entitled to a payment are there any issues are there any things that we can help out with and in some many cases it's it's w9 
it's a bad address. It's it's something. And again, uh, in 2021, we saw a lot of, we were able to drill down and, and solve a lot of those problems. And again, I encourage anybody watching this listening, if you have any issues, it's two emails you can remember. Contingency at NHRA.com. It's going to go to me and a couple other people. Or you can email me directly. My name is David Kennedy. It's dkennedy at NHRA.com. It's not my only job within NHRA, but it is something that I take very seriously. So it's the type of thing where I want to facilitate this. If anyone's having an issue, dkennedy at NHRA.com or contingency at NHRA.com. Um, and it's, again, it's the type of thing where, as I've told other people in other podcasts and other conversations, the only risk you run is that I'm a talker. So if you call me on the phone, we're going to probably have a 30-minute conversation, and I'm going to enjoy it. But it's 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 also the type of thing I'm, I'm hoping you know we're going to solve your problem on the back end, too. Um, so. If you have an issue or you come in, um, you can reach out to me, reach out to those two emails. But these three levels, come in complimentary, post the national event. Have you have great success? We would suggest to you, you look at broadening horizon and go to the 44 divisional events. If you do that for a few years and it's really working well or you want to expand, um, choose two paths. You can add more products. Going back to the lug nut, maybe now you're in the wheel stud business. Maybe you're in the wheel business. Maybe you're in the axle shaft business. Uh, manufacturer can add additional postings. No additional fee to NHRA to do so. So in the case of, um, let's say, uh, let's say Edelbrock, um, post for cylinder heads, post for cam, excuse me, post for cylinder heads, post for intake manifolds. Um, there were times where they post for uh, other products within that portfolio. Each additional posting uh, we know is good for the racers, good for the manufacturer. And just the only requirement for them is a new sticker in many cases. So if you have a cylinder head, Edelbrock cylinder head, if you have Edelbrock intake manifold, that's that's basically your investment uh, to the program, making sure you have decals, uh, contingency program decals. Again, after all that works and you've had a great program, great run in the system, uh, the final step is the major level sponsorship. A major level sponsorship uh, comes with all the features and benefits of the first two programs we're talking about. You can display at the national events, excuse me, you can post at the national events, you can post at the divisional events, and you also now get to Pardon me, so I'm hearing some noise. Right. You can now display at na all national events. And with that display comes the need for tickets to come into these events and the potential for hard cards for your staff to staff these events. Uh, at that level, again, from the racer standpoint, all these programs look the same. But then the major sponsorship level comes with a fee of $7,656 for the year. Uh, again, that uh, covers a 20 by 25 foot display space, covers tickets to come in, into the race on the order of about 194 credentials that you get for the course of the year. Um, and then the potential to, to change those out for some hard cards if you're staffing with the same two people uh, at all events. Again, that fee um, is a tremendous deal, uh, but it's the type of program that if you want to come and activate at a national event, that's, that's the top level. So seven thousand six hundred fifty-six bucks. Some people ask, "Is that per event?" No, nope, that's for the whole season. And that's quite a number. How'd you come up with that one? Seven six well, five. Well, it's, it's interesting. It's so not in, a rock uh, song. Twenty twenty-one. <laughs> Here you go. No, it's it's you know it, it's it's a good point. For decades, it was seventy-five hundred bucks, and I'm not sure how that number came about. Um, but it, it is built off of effectively what a display space costs at an event. Uh, again, I'm not in the business of selling display space, but I could tell you just to give you a sense of the value. Uh, display space at each event would be about 7,500 bucks. So if you and I wanted to come with our lug nut business and we get a 20 by 25 foot space at the Indianapolis race, we, we should expect to pay about 7,500 bucks for that display space. If you're a contingency sponsor, uh, NHRA is interested in you paying racers significantly more than that per year, you know, on the order of tens of thousands of dollars from manufacturer to racer um, so we will facilitate anything we can to help you get in front of more racers, get your staff and your partners in front of, uh, of NHRA racing. So again, it's, it's a very efficient um, kind of loss leader type of program for us, because like I said at the beginning, we know what racers are going to do with the money they win. They're going to come back and race more. And if manufacturers see the NHRA racing uh, venue as a successful marketplace, we know they're going to come in and ask, how do they step up to other levels? Now, within any trade, there's other marketing programs. There's ways to spend uh, tremendous amounts of money uh, and reach, you know, television, reach, uh, you know, event level sponsorship. You know, those programs exist. They're, they're outside of contingency. 
um, that would be a handoff. But again, there are, there are the many higher levels. So contingency yeah. caps your financial commitment to NHRA at 7656 bucks. Then I, I, my next question is then, but I, I swear I've seen certain manufacturers only post for divisional level, but not national. So how's that possible? Because well, I think Autometer, Data Acquisition, Caltrax, uh, Suspension, I think they're divisional only, aren't they? Well, you can do that. And, and if there are companies that had participated at this level and decided, let's just post at the divisional level, uh, they will pay a $1,000 fee to do so. And I think strategically, they may decide, let's reach effectively all of sports and racing because everybody that races at a national event has, has been at a divisional event that year. So the, the pay amounts, payout amounts are lower per winner, per runner up. And for some companies that might fit within their budgetary goals. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I think it becomes an opportunity for them to decide they would rather invest the money in it coming out to four or five races and display at the divisional event. And it just, again, fits into their business model uh, better. Uh, and, and generally those are customers that have been doing this for a, a long, long time. So the, the myth of, you know, for years we've heard, oh, the manufacturer has to pay NHRA $10,000 and whatever they don't pay to the racer, NHRA keeps that money and things like that. That's all not well, true then. I, I, I can tell you then, and the agreement that we sent out to all our partners had language like that. And to the best of my knowledge, my research, and again, this program dates back to 66 and I, over here, I have a folder printed out from 1996 that talks about minimum payouts. And minimum payouts typically have been, uh, you'll see numbers of, as a major sponsor, $17,000 minimum has to be paid from manufacturer or racer. And again, while we don't touch that money, we effectively can track how much money a manufacturer has paid out. Uh, I, I think the rationale for the language about minimum payouts was because effectively, NHRA is giving you probably more than a $17,000 value if you're a major sponsor in terms of credentials, hard cards, and display space. They want to they wanna be uh, generous at the same time they want to be sustainable. So I think when you had partners that were not paying uh, good amounts of money, reliable amounts of money, um, having intention to pay racers, that was the type of thing where minimum language was inserted to prevent uh, non uh, non good intention manufacturers from participating in this program. Today, I would tell you, I don't have any record of us ever collecting money. And I've only been part of this program some for the last you know five years. Uh, it's possible in the past, but I we have no interest in collecting that. And my my administration, my policies would be: if you're a major sponsor, and you're not paying out seventeen thousand dollars to a racer, a group of racers in a calendar year. I'm going to say you're now participating at the complimentary level. Well, that's what I was going to say. The complimentary level, if you pay 300 to win and 100 to runner-up for, what, 24 national events? I think it is. That's only 9,600. So you can't even hit the 17, even if you are paying every event. So there are other categories. And I apologize here. Yeah. There are other categories we can we can talk about. And you can talk pro stock, uh, the two natural classes, it's $500 to win, $100 to runner up. You also have class racing. And we've increased the number of class racing scenarios for manufacturers to pay out. So in the past, it was effectively four races for super stock and stock class racing to win. And there was up to, I think, 167 scenarios in super stock. And I think, I think it's approximately 67, uh, let's see, 167 and... Let me get this wrong. Maybe uh, maybe 100 and, 124 scenarios in super stock, 67 scenarios in, in stock. And of those, every winner in every one of those scenarios would be eligible for $100 payment. Uh, so that allowed other rate, you know, other manufacturers to reach uh, their goals. You could also pay down the semifinalist level. Uh, you can pay in the Summit ET series. Payment there is $200 to win, $100 to runner up. Uh, you could pay Nitro Harley, Pro Mod, Factory Stock. Uh, we we find ways to connect manufacturers and racers to get to those minimum amounts. And then you have manufacturers that pay more than these minimum amounts where you get agreements that in a certain category, again, using Ford, Dodge, and Chevy, uh, if you are uh, running a drag pack car, Copo car, um, Cobra jet car, and you win at the national event level in factory stock, that's a $2,500 payment. If you run her up, that's a $1,000 payment. 
uh, if you have that same car and you're running in, um, I believe stock eliminator the, at the divisional level, I think it's a thousand dollar payment to win $500 to runner up. So there are scenarios, again, uh, we are looking to increase uh, the number of payouts. But again, the, when you don't make the minimums, in the past, there was language that suggested there was a financial penalty. And that caught the attention of a lot of previous companies, a lot of previous administrations, and, and caused confusion amongst racers. So I think we could be clear here that uh, NHRA is not going to collect any money from any manufacturer. Uh, but we are going to want manufacturers to, in good faith, participate in this program and and pay significant amounts of money to racers directly to make their efforts more sustainable. And in reality, money paid to racers is commensurate with money of products sold to racers. So any company looking to participate in this, this is not a loss leader for you as a manufacturer. Uh, if you sell camshafts and you pay out $300 to winners, effectively, you've probably sold dozens to hundreds to thousands of camshafts. Uh, your sales will always eclipse payout because there's only so many winning and runner-up scenarios, as you pointed out. The maximum payout uh, is going to always eclipse the maximum uh, retail sale. And again, that's that makes it a viable uh, marketplace because you as the racer we talked about at the beginning, you want to be successful, just keep winning, keep those checks coming in. Um, but that's why, that's why this program has been around for so long. That's why this program... Uh, as the marketplaces evolve, you know, we go back from, you know, this program predates in many cases, the catalog, and certainly predates mail order, predates the internet, predates uh, social media. So it's a, it's a program that allowed a connection of manufacturers and racers in the marketplace of NHRA um, to have successes uh, collectively. And today, even with all those new features and, and new ways to reach audience, it still continues to succeed. Um, but yeah, the idea of the minimum payouts, again, in, in my administration, uh, we're going to have good relationships with manufacturers. And if you're not meeting minimum payouts, the idea of stepping into a complimentary level where that minimum is not necessary. But I'm also going to want to make sure that you're using the marketplace correctly, because again, I can see a tremendous opportunity here. And if you're not meeting, meeting those minimums, um, there's opportunity there for us to have a conversation to get you there, make this marketplace more viable, more vibrant for you. So what type of involvement are you getting from the auto manufacturers? Like, are they actively involved? Are you, do you, I mean, are you the one having the conversation with them? Are they wanting to participate in it? Or is it something you kind of have to drag them into? I mean, what's, what's that look like? Sure. It's a good point. So my, my background, I, I, I grew up wanting to be part of NHRA, but I didn't grow up in a house that went drag racing. So uh, I was from Western Massachusetts and the first NHRA level event that I ever went to was in English Town. It was not for an NHRA event. So back then, uh, in the 80s and 90s, to become part of the NHRA, you either had to grow up in it or you had to go to a national event to kind of see it. And a membership was not a not an obvious path. I, I didn't know how to I don't know how to become a member. I didn't know where to send the check to in Glendora to do so. Uh, that memory stays with me because I always want to make sure we we keep this as easy as possible to you know, participate with NHRA. So I'm a car guy. Um, I have gone up to the car magazine ranks. 2000, 21 years ago, I moved to California and I worked for the company that Wally Parks worked for. I had a different name, but I came to uh, what was then EMAP USA, uh, which was what purchased the Peterson Publishing uh, Empire. Uh, I worked in off-road, I worked in diesel, and then I took over Hot Rod Magazine. Um, and after being there for 16 years and living in that car magazine world where you're around manufacturers and our relationship was different, you know, we were adjacent to NHRA. We'd come to the U.S. Nationals and cover the racing and then leave before the pros raced because, you know, again, the idea of what stock limiter and super stock cars are capable of, that was the thing that we thought the closest connection to the automotive uh, audience that we had at the time and just tremendous experience. So Taking all those relationships, 16 years of talking with manufacturers, again, from off-road to diesel to hot rodding, allowed me to build a lot of relationships and know a lot of people. Um, and in some cases, grow up with them. So as they progressed in the decision-making within their companies, um, our relationship could sustain. So for me, talking to the car companies, uh, talking to the aftermarket has been easier than I think a lot of my predecessors have had who have come up to the drag racing ranks, where they would know manufacturers that we're already participating with NHRA. 
But as you know, NHRA is so all consuming uh, that sometimes it's hard to get out of just our sphere. So to go one step further at a PRI show, at a SEMA show, uh, there's enough people within the NHRA ranks that you could soak up you know, all your time there. So again, for me coming uh, from outside of the ranks has been helpful in this case. So my Rolodex is a little bit different, a little bit bigger, uh, a little bit broader, and I can bring new partners in. Um, in the case of the existing, let's, let's call them 85 companies with 115 postings, uh, these are brands that are known to me. Um, but in some cases, the, the smaller participants that were racers first and, and manufacturers second aren't known. Um, when I wanted to bring in new partners, being able to explain and trade contingency is one of those conversation starters of it's really, it's really an opportunity to reach more than 45,000 racers. And as I've kind of evolved, I come from the business to consumer marketplace where you have a product and you want to sell it to the enthusiast consumer and you want to sell on passion and and then coming to NHRA, we talk. We have a lot of business-to-business -business relationships. A lot of racers are entrepreneurs or business owners. And while they have a passion and enthusiasm, they also have an entrepreneurial mindset that they can't just spend all the money they have. they got to spend money in ways that's going to make a difference to their program. And so I've kind of evolved this to see it's just more than a business-to-enthusiast or business-to-customer uh, consumer. It's not business-to-business. -business, it's business-to-racer, which comes with the passion of a business to consumer, but with a longer term arc of a business to business relationship. So it's, it's really a good place to be and coming out of COVID, uh, again, something we didn't anticipate learning, but uh, all of our smallest partners uh, were the most reliable. The largest partners, um, again, multinational companies that have performance divisions, they were hit hard um, because large scale manufacturing, when you make a million of something a day, and all of a sudden you have to turn that off. That's a hard thing to turn back on. And when you turn it off for a few days, few weeks, few months, it really hurts your bottom line to the point that a lot of big marketing programs uh, don't work or you don't have the money up front to, uh, to start. So contingency becomes an easy way to get into a new grassroots marketing program. Again, it's probably the only grassroots marketing program that a tier one manufacturer can even be eligible for. Um, so that's, again, it's, it's been a good way to have a conversation. Uh, I expect that's where most of the growth will come in 2022 and beyond is companies looking to have a no upfront cost marketing partnership that gives them access to 45,000 customers that are vibrant customers with money and resource that want to succeed um, and customers that are going to come in for the long haul and, and be a reliable partner, um, not just a one-time purchase. So, and I, like I said, forgive me, I'm new to this. I haven't done a lot of the NHRA stuff, so I'm pretty green to the contingency program. But sure. it seems that some companies already have, like, a, they handle their own contingency. Sure. Um, what would be an advantage to signing up with NHRA and letting them handle it other than just, I mean, is it checking the stickers and taking some of the ease out of verifying that? Or what's the advantage? Why come to you instead of just doing our own? I guess let me ask you that. Oh, it's that's an excellent question. And and from my perspective, I mean, we have no issue with somebody else running their own contingency program. Uh, the only concern I'll have with that is that I think if you are doing your own contingency program and sending somebody to their, all the races, um, or doing your due diligence uh, with photos after the fact, it's not going to be as easy as just having us do it for you. Because as a course of action, we're going to take all the people that win a runner up and we're going to do a verification, whether there's two products, whether there's no products, you know, we're going to talk, we're going to look at the race cars, again, stock and super stock categories. Uh, we're going to get intimately um, connected to these vehicles. So we're, we're doing the work anyway. Uh, we're creating the reports anyway. And to be able to pass that information on to a manufacturer, we're going to do the, the most cumbersome parts of the program. Uh, the only limitation, and again, I've had a few conversations with companies that say, I do my own contingency program. Um, I don't need to pay NHRA to do this for me. And I said, well, there's no fee. And they think, wait a minute, there's no fee. I don't have to pay anything to do for this. And I said, no, uh, you do have to pay the racer. In some cases, people that manage their own contingency programs uh, will do gift cards, product. Um, they will do something lower than the financial uh, thresholds that we've established. So uh, typically, typically, again, if I'm a company with this, 
it's always going to be easier to use NHRA's contingency program. Um, the only requirements that you have to get over is decide, pay $300 to win, $100 to runner up. If you want to pay $50 to win and give a $25 gift card, um, that's outside of our expectations. And again, it's because we want that money to go to racers so they can do what they need to do, uh, make the decisions the way they know to make them. So that's that's the only limitation is if you if you as a manufacturer at the national level can't do the $300 to win, $100 to runner up, or at the divisional level, $100 win, $50 to runner up, um, that's the only hurdle you have to get over because we're going to make it easier. And, and maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Let's say this is race weekend. Um, it's it's Sunday night and the race is over. Uh, NHRA has collected uh, through paper and, and clipboards information about race cars, decals, and products. I'm going to go over this uh, probably in a little bit of quick minutia at the end. Those reports are going to end up via email coming back to California on Tuesday morning. We're then going to review all those claims and digitize them and create reports that get sent out to the manufacturers that are uh, affected by and uh, have to make payouts. They're going to get that by the Friday uh, of that week. So when on Sunday, a manufacturer is going to a, a digital report on Friday, and that's the turnaround time uh, that we offer these partners. Um, so before in many cases, you know, another company could compile all that information for themselves. We can send it to you in an email. Uh, you get a portal login and you can see all your payout scenarios for the course of a year. Uh, by event, by um, by series, and you can even go back and look at, at previous years so you can see where you are. I think that's why you know, we're, it's, it's going to make more sense to do it with us. And if for companies that have thought there was a, an upfront fee that prevented them from participating with us, um, again, we can't say that too much. It doesn't have to be a fee. Um, come in at the complimentary level and, and have a good business, have great relationships with racers, and, and enjoy this. Um, maybe at this point we go one or two ways. Um, the actual process we could probably talk through just so you can see from what we think it should be. And then we could talk about, you know, maybe Bob here and Gary, what, what it actually is from a racer's perspective and kind of come to some understanding. Cause I'll learn some things here while I'm also telling uh, you guys and your audience what I think it should be, uh, what they should be prepared for. So I just want to um, check on that report. You're also in that report. You have all their mailing address. I mean, you have all their information that you're sending to the companies right it is and again I, I i appreciate that that's a great point too because one of the one of the things that's become a popular buzzword or term in the modern area is who owns the customer so when you have a relationship with a customer um if you can send them money but never really know who they are or um, you never know who your customer is it can be sort of valuable in this case when when you win a runner-up and if i'm a tire manufacturer and I want to understand who my customer base is. When you participate in the contingency program, if you pay for a winner, runner up, down to the semifinalist, to the class winner, you get a tremendous amount of data about who your customers are going to be. And it's current data. It's data that's going to share um, name, mailing address, email, phone number. It's going to share vehicle type, engine size. Um, it's also going to share other products that that, manu that, that racer uh, has claimed on their tech sheet. And that's that's information that could be helpful to a number of levels. And you as a manufacturer get that information. It's not a, a proxy code. It's It allows you to have a relationship with a racer. So one of the areas for companies that want to take advantage of having a relationship with a racer, having dialogue like this, having feedback, it's a fantastic way to know your audience and gain a, a lot of participants um, for your company, for your brand in a very easy way, uh, in a very authentic way, in a legitimate way, uh, a pre-vetted way, because you know who the winners are, you know who the runners up are, uh, you know how, how they've been doing. And now you can, again, have dialogues, have, you know, have relationship and that could be invaluable to a company in today's day and age. Well, it also simplifies the whole process. Like, I have their mailing address. I know where they're at, so I don't have to have five people check on it. Like, here's the sheet. This guy won. Here's his address. That's where the check goes. You turn that to accounts receivable. Boom. I mean, it sounds really simple. And, and you're right, because there's a, there's a portal that allows you to see it as a uh, an interface. And it's it's not public facing, but it, it, there's, not, it's not, there's no secrets there. Um, it's a, a portal that will allow you to look at it and say, okay, who won at uh, South Georgia? And you would come in and you would say, it's a Luxo Divisional event. 
you go down to event two one uh, division two first event and and see the payout scenarios and you click on it and again it would be almost it'd be a very web friendly experience but then if, if once you get up and running with this there's also a button where you download a, C, a csv file uh, and you are able to literally take data and flow it into your spreadsheets flow it into your system and in some cases just pass that um that excel sheet to your accounts payable and say these people have been pre-vetted by nhra nhra has passed on these people should be paid and it can be that hands off um, because NHRA has done that work. And, and we, we, we've made it that easy for partners. Um, again, you can interact more, but it can be that simple too. So why- It definitely sounds like the program stepping into the 21st century here. But well, what, it, what a lot of the racers you know, that are listening right now wanna know is, and just me cleaning out dad's garage, going through sure. old national dragsters from the 80s and early 90s. You could win 20 grand winning an event back then. I just won yep. about six. Now, maybe I could have had like three or four more stickers. What happened? I mean, this was up until early 2000s, maybe until the crash of 2008. You could win a ton more money than you're winning right now. Unfortunately for me, I started racing in 2009, so it started going away. But even in, let's say, 2016, 17, you know, 18, the economy was roaring again. It just, it's not what it used to be. Uh, it sounds like you guys are making, like taking a lot of strides to get people in, but is there any hope that it could ever get back to, to that level? And on top of that, like the giveaways that they used to have, uh, who was it? Uh, Powerade or something used to give you like a cooler when you entered a national event, I think. Or it used to get free oil, free like spark plugs and stuff back in the 80s, 90s, and I'm, I'm assuming before that. Like what happened to all that stuff? Is there any possibility that like this could become like a great, great program again well and and i think the answer is yes and i think the idea of again it, it's it's a marketplace so like any marketplace it is susceptible to things that change things that change in other marketplaces adjacent to us so Bob, as you're talking about again i'm relatively new to this i came to this industry in 2000 um in 2000 the internet existed but it wasn't everywhere like it is now in 2000 um social media did not exist in, in 2000, mail order um, online, you know, purchasing using your credit card was possible, but it didn't really exist. So I, I think that the answers of why it's changed is, is market related. Um, so again, just understanding the idea of other avenues for, for companies to market became possible. And so new companies had to look at new, new avenues and new, new paths. And in many cases, um, those, those changes affected a contingency program because now they, they looked at the same marketing budget to do new things. Um, there's also scenarios where concentration of ownership of the aftermarket has affected the number of postings that have, have occurred. So uh, if you took a large company, and again, I'll, I'll look at uh, a big oil filter company that um, the brand still exists, but the ownership has changed so many times that you had a, a you had a company that had a motorsport facing division, uh, and then after being bought and sold a number of times and being uh, merged into a large conglomerate, they they have no motorsport awareness anymore. So that contingency relationship evaporated. Um, in this case, again, you have um, you have companies that have done a consolidation. Um, because they have to get right size for this marketplace where you know they have competitors that they didn't have before and, and retail challenges that they didn't have before. So any anytime you have a concentration of, uh, of one company owning a number of smaller brands that used to post in contingency, that has had a, a challenging impact uh, for the contingency pro program. And again, I think where we're offsetting it is, is also, the, and this is what I'm excited about, um, COVID saw a number of changes, but it also saw more people applying for business licenses, more people launching online ventures and, and small business um, small business efforts. And, and there are a number of them in racing, and that's fantastic for us because NHRA is a great platform to supercharge your marketing efforts because you know, if you started to make a product in your garage, your basement, you're, you're 3D printing some race component uh, because you have that expertise. You might not be able to compete with the big brands uh, with million dollar marketing budgets, but you can come into an NHRA 
contingency program, no no money up front, and reach racers and, and get the ball rolling at a scale that can allow you to again participate with forty five thousand reliable customers have money, and in many cases, you know that that's the thing I'm very excited about now. Uh, we we can work very well with large companies and large partners, multinational, million billion dollar industries, uh, but we are also very good at reaching the guy that he has no money and just got started and wants to sell products to racers, products that are going to help racers do what they want to do, which is win and have a better time. So that's the part I'm very excited about. Again, I think I think the idea of uh, to go back to the way it was and, and let's arbitrarily pick. I, I have data back to 2007. I could show you who I could create a, a super stock sheet, stock eliminator sheet in 2007. And I, and I have this to see, all right, where are these brands? How, how do I get back to, to that? And the obstacles that I come up against are, well, that company is now owned by this other company. Uh, that company used to compete with this company. And now they, did, they, they don't continue to compete head to head as they once did. Um, but, you know, can I find somebody else in that marketplace that doesn't have this big name? And we make sure that they're aware of, they can participate here. Again, th- those are the good conversations. And then are there categories um, that never existed before and that might exist now? And the, the idea of the 3D printed part, there isn't, um, the, the program, the system wasn't built around some of the new realities that we have. You know, EFI was added as a component um, and it, it wasn't wasn't that long. It was before I got there, but not that much earlier than when I got there. And so uh, EV category, again, it, it won't affect a lot of people early on. But in 2022, there's now an EV category for somebody T-series racing. So products made for swapping Tesla drivetrains into, into hot rods. You know, those are things that um, you know, NHRA is aware of, and, and we are able to have that before that product maybe even exists. So again, I, I think that uh, my charge is, again, it's not a profit center, it's a success center. So anything I can do, it's going to help the marketplace of drag racing. That's going to help NHRA racers. And then that's going to take care of NHRA. So it's it's a there's a no downside, and and that's the beauty. Whenever you get involved in some program, that all three people will equally win. Fantastic. So it's got to grow. It's going to grow. Um, I think this these conversations are helpful, so that somebody wants to somebody listening can say, I didn't realize I I'm able to participate with. That. I don't know. I didn't have to have hundred thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, two thousand um, dollars. And then maybe another piece of information that could be helpful too is that. Today, we have people signing up for a 2022 program. This afternoon, I, I will finalize 2022 agreements. In reality, I need to move this to finalizing 2023 agreements, finalizing 2024 agreements, so that you as a racer can know, all right, I'm going to have to buy a per- product and influence my purchase decision by saying, by telling me you're going to partner with me in years to come, not, not this year, because your car is built. You know, you, There are things you're going to buy in 2022 but in reality i can't influence the big ticket items at this point based on a contingency posting um, i got to get the clock reset and that's been some of my heavy lifting as well as helping manufacturers realize let's let's get let's get your fiscal year your calendar year and your contingency year reset correctly so that everybody can win and again that's another way we'll grow this this program yeah well i I can appreciate what you're doing there and all that, but I'm just, I'm still kind of baffled, like, why NHRA would even want to mess with this. Like, you're, you're given the data, like, there's not really, you know, everybody wants to say you're the evil part, like NHRA and the contingency, like, they've, it's not what it's been, but literally, there's not really anything there. I mean, I don't know why you'd want to go through all the hassle. Like, what's in it for NHRA? There's... Well, and again, I, I these conversations, I think, are so helpful because when I got there in 2016, the first thing I would tell you is that NHRA has great meetings with great caring people, and we would have them in the Glendower office. And a lot of that great care and conversation wasn't wasn't obvious to anyone outside of working at NHRA. Um, and it's the type of thing where contingency program is that type of thing. Um, when I, I came to NHRA, I was aware of what contingency was, but I didn't really understand how it worked. Um, and then when I started to understand it, I thought, man, if you invented this, today if you said okay we're going to tell manufacturers that you can participate in a program where racers are going to buy they're not going to get your product for free they're not asking for a sponsorship this is a partnership Uh, they're going to buy your product and they're going to run your decal on the car and that that is acceptable we we look at race cars with decals on the side and that that is normal to us right we've always seen it that way 
And when they win a runner up, you're as a manufacturer going to send them a check for their success. And if they win, 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 at some point, you know, they're going to get positive on that purchase. And it's going to be okay because that marketing, you know, effort of those decals, there's a 36 square inch decal on the other side of the car that people like me look at, people like you look at and say, I never heard of that company, but they make carburetors. And I see that guy winning with them. I got I to gotta know more about that. And not because of a big marketing effort that says on national TV, buy this carburetor, but because I literally saw that guy beat every other person that I, I value and I see the products that are running. So it's, again, it's, it's influential marketing before that even existed. That's great. I want NHRA drag race to be a vibrant marketplace where manufacturers see themselves. And I want racers to be able to do what they love. You know, I, I thought I was a car guy, came to NHRA, and I realized that this is this is an entrepreneurial marketplace where you are car guys that don't take all the money you have and recklessly throw it in, throw it away. You know, you do smart things with your money. And when you do smart things with your money, people like me can watch and learn and be smart and be sustainable. So contingency program from an NHRA standpoint is a sustainability program. We want you to be able to do what you love. And we want to do anything we can do to foster it makes sense to us, especially when, like I said, it, it's a win-win-win. If the manufacturers can see themselves participating in this, you know, General Motors can participate with NHRA drag racing, even if it's just at the contingency level, it's good for it's good for General Motors, it's good for NHRA, it's good for the racer. Um, and again, we know we know what you're going to do with the money that General Motors gives you. You're going to come back and race again. Um, and again, that, that's that's a great situation. So it's always going to be worth it um, from the the love and the passion of I, I want you to be able to do what you do. I want to be able to tell your stories, um, and we can segue into that at some point too. You know, there are great stories to be told, and we you know the people that win and runner up they get the brightest light shined on them. Um, so that becomes part of the opportunity, and to help people that aren't in the winner circle you know what's what's the thing they need to do to get there in some cases some cases it's the simplest product that they're not running um contingency can help them down that path and then again the conversations and the education uh, of what it takes to have a, a serious race effort uh, to beat other serious race efforts you know that that's where the stories get interesting so it's always gonna be worth it to us uh, to nhra because it's worth it to you guys it's worth it to the races worth it to the manufacturers um and no matter what what you know internet in uh, social media augmented reality virtual reality trends occur um it's always gonna be worth it for us let's talk about that part i guess as far as putting the spotlight on sports and racers and some of that and multimedia and like sure. touch base on that i mean where's nhra going with some of those programs well when, when i got here in 2016 a lot of it was due to the the fox nhra partnership and the NHRA on Fox partnership was saw, seen as a, a much better platform than the previous commitment um, to shine a light on the organization. And, and I should probably, you know, again, back up and even start with this because a couple things that people don't necessarily think of NHRA this way, but NHRA was started by a magazine editor, uh, Wally Parks, magazine editor of Hot Rod Magazine, um, editorial director of of trend publishing which at one point was seven magazines including motor trend and car craft uh, so you had an organization you have a motorsport organization started by a media guy uh, he ran monthly car magazine he came to nhra um, started effectively an association didn't come he created he fabricated the idea of he realized people wanted more than just uh, a car magazine to read they wanted a collective uh anti experience so an association of associations of clubs come together and they said, okay, I, this is valuable more than just media, but I can use the tools of media to reach those people. Uh, so he started newsletters, newsletters, tie rod and drag link. Um, realized then that come 1960 national dragster launches in 1960. He's in a quasi he's working for Robert E. Peterson. And he's also got his own car magazine that looks like it would compete with what Robert E. Peterson is doing. But somehow, some way, that didn't wasn't an issue because the largest ad in the very first issue of National Dragster, on the on the second page as you open the cover, is from Robert E. Peterson's company. So, it got off to a great start, and you had a, a magazine editor starting a racing motorsport organization. Uh, so the tools of media have always been a big part of this, and the idea of when Dragster went weekly, you know that was unheard of 
back before I was here during the U.S. Nationals, we would have a daily paper that would come out. They would literally print it at night. And all these tools were using print because that was the only thing we had. Uh, NHRA.com, social media, uh, while early adopters, and but reaching to their audience, and these were platforms that Wally would have loved Twitter because of the ability to reach people every 20 seconds if you want to. So having this media timeline and trend and influence within the company means that we're always looking to share the stories, share the message. And for a long time, I think we only were focused on broadcasting to our constituents. Okay, come back to my story about, I want to be an HRA member, but because my family wasn't into it, I had never been to a national event. I couldn't break into it. And what was hard. Now, using all these platforms that we have, um, the break into NHRA might be showing somebody a car that looks like a 69 Camaro that they can relate to or a 2019 Camaro that they can relate to. Um, we have a lot of great opportunities to use these tools of media that are outside just the reach of an NHRA membership base that's already part of this experience and, and grow and grow and grow. So uh, when I got here, NHRA, dot, uh, NHRA TV, uh, originally called NHRA All Access when I came, it was a resource where I have every sportsman run at every national event. You know, I have it from dawn to dusk, every run occurred. And it became, wasn't, again, it wasn't obvious at first, but it quickly became clear of these were runs and rounds that people were seeing in the live venue. And if you were watching it, you could see, but these were opportunities to cut and share and distribute this footage. Um, that was better than anything, in many cases, that we can write because you were able to see uh, these final rounds go down. And so we started to scoop up and cut up uh, these runs. We started in some cases uh, broadcasting the first round uh, of qualifying uh, on a race weekend and just taking effectively two terabytes of TV content come back from every national event. Uh, that's a, a lot of footage. And we always want to make sure that we're, you know, we're collecting and archiving this and we have basically every run ever made back to, in some cases, the 50s but we want to be able to share that. So new media platforms have allowed for that and just having awareness of, uh, again, things like I'll use national dragsters as an example. Not everybody knows this, but you win a runner up uh, the national event, your photo is going to be a national dragster. You're going to see yourself side by side with the competition. And there's a QR code right underneath that. Um, again, for me, it's obvious, but we're going to make a much stronger push here. When you click, when you put your phone in front of that QR code, you're going to see the final round as called from NHRA.tv. And you know, you're gonna see in many cases your winner interview after that run has happened. And that's just one of those things that whatever story we could tell about it, um, it's probably not gonna be as good as just actually being able to show you that run, hear the announce, hear the moment, hear the call, see your celebrations of the windshield as as your excitement happens. And again, just sharing that, uh, sharing it in a way that then you can share it on your social media, uh, share it in a way that's on YouTube, it's on NHRA.tv. Com. It's on NHRA.tv. Um, it's it's on the TV show. Um, you know, this is the idea of take one piece of content and put it everywhere that we can. And, and we have some ideas going forward. Or how can we share that even more reliably? Um, how can we archive it so that if you want to see everybody's winning run um, back to when NHRA.tv existed? You know, there's some there's some good opportunities there to use these tools of media that we have collected and we archive and share. Same on the photo side. You know, we, we have photos uh, at every at every event. Um, and those are images that we use for national dragster, but can we can we get about more to our social media, more to NHRA.tv, more to photo galleries? Uh, I'm working on a project to take NHRA's photo archive, which is so awesome, you wouldn't believe it, but you have to work at NHRA to see it in its entirety right now. And that's, that's just not an acceptable uh, limitation because Again, the type of thing where you could see just an arc of racing and, and every photo of you or your dad and his dad, whenever they won, you know, I, I'm going to have it. And, and that's a great, uh, that, that's, that's a great opportunity. And uh, again, just finding the right ways to share that so that, so that people can enjoy it and, and participate with it. Well, one thing I don't quite understand either. So entry puts a lot of focus on the pro side of things. You know, there's what, 14 teams there like how do we get back to sportsman side like there's more people are interested in the sportsman side than the pro side i mean i get 
the pros sell the tickets, the pros, you know, if everybody wants to come watch the pros, but how do we put more focus on the bread and butter? I mean, those 14 teams coming in are basically, they win winning the money that all the sportsman racers are putting into the race. I mean, how do we focus on the, I mean, maybe, you know, we're, we're sportsman racers, so we think we're pretty and we're the ones that matter, but, you know, I just feel like we're not getting the, whether it be the media or the coverage, I mean, the, if the sportsman racers quit showing up, the pros aren't going to be there either. I just feel like, how do we change the focus? Well, and, and I think that you're right. And I think that, you know, we, you know, we talked about in 2020, um, we were all about the sportsman racer and it was the type of thing where just, again, just truth of, of the situation where 2020 COVID was the most challenging year NHRA has ever had. Um, and there were so many unknowns that could we even go racing. And when NHRA stuck its neck out to go racing, the sports and racers are the first ones that, you know, filled the stage lands of events. And we had events with car counts that uh, not only were they pre COVID level, but in higher. And it was the type of thing where we realized, you know, the constituents, and then realizing that in 2020, you know, everybody was a sports and racer again, because everybody was kind of going back and everybody's program um, was taken back down to the fundamentals. The biggest difference, I think, in terms of the pros and the sportsmen are, you know, the story opportunities and the awareness, uh, the personalities. There are sports and racers uh, with big personalities that are easy for us to know and easy for us to follow. Um, and that's the type of thing that, again, we kind of, we started to look at it and say, all right, how do we develop this net and this awareness um, of the sports racers? Again, as you saw, Bobby, at, at, at PRI, PRI show for everybody that watches, it's familiar with it's been, you know, it's been going on, I think, since the 80s uh, in Indianapolis. NHRA does a stage show there for three days. Prior to that, we do a stage show at the SEMA show in Las Vegas uh, the month before for four days. We do more people across the stage at PRI than we do in four days at SEMA because of the sports and racers and the number of people and constituency and the energy that comes around it. At PRI, the show starts at nine and ends at five or thereabouts. We started doing interviews before the show opened with sports and racers. And in some cases went after the show was closed because there's just that many more conversations uh, when we get into the heartland and get around our, our constituency and just you know, shining a bright light on, on those people and hearing those stories. And in some cases, um, it, it starts a conversation. It starts a conversation that should have started a long time ago, but gives us that opportunity to develop a relationship. So again, it's kind of like this where we all think we know what a sports and racer is. We all think we know who the, the players and the names are. But in truth, um, there's dozens more with interesting stories and interesting efforts and interesting, you know, things that we can connect with. But, you know, at the beginning of this conversation, we were connecting about family. Um, and it's, again, we think we're car guys in reality. We're people, people, we're people guys. Um, and cars and racing are the thing that allow us to come together and share this experience. Um, I, I, I think that when we find stories to tell, we got to make sure we have platforms to share them on. We have to make sure we have imagery to go with them. Um, but I think it's also a great opportunity to say, all right, here's a, a father and son effort. Here's a family effort, or here's a new race that's coming in. And how do they get in? What do they do? Again, for me, the content and contingency departments, some people would have thought they were this far apart. And I'm seeing them you know, closer and closer every day. The content you know, is contingency and the stories that come from the companies or from the racers, uh, these become opportunities to shine bright lights on the sports and racers where there is a lot of change, there is some dynamic, uh, the cars are being built, cars are, you know, what you race, multiple cars being raced, multiple classes being raced in, you know, in some cases that becomes interesting effort of the different cars you're, that you're running, um, the different cars, different categories that you're competing in, and the strategy that comes along with that. Those all become opportunities for us to shine lights on that we, we're starting to hear about now. We work with division directors, you know, ask them, uh, they do a weekly call on Tuesday mornings, we were on it yesterday. What what things are happening, what's the buzz that, that you're hearing about locally that then we can become aware of uh, in the California office to tell those stories. So the net is uh, is getting broader. Uh, we're able to use the uh, again, the tools that we have from everything from NHRA.tv to the NHRA Fox broadcast, NHRA.com, uh, our social media channels through NHRA. These are all great platforms to reach beyond just the membership base. Uh, national dragsters, everybody that's watching this that's an NHRA member knows. And we went to a much better paper um, in 2021 
And the rationale for that was, if it's coming in your door, we want you to pick it up and feel like this is good. This is, feels nice. And my photos now look better uh, because the paper is better and the ink is better. Um, you know, it's just want to make sure that you have each, each media category optimized for the opportunity that it represents. And for the day, and this is a sense of pride for me, if you can show somebody that is new to NHRA racing, you know, here's a picture of me in a national publication that got mailed to tens of thousands of people. Uh, and it's, it's not like your phone where no, no one's looking at your phone and seeing, let me show you this great website that I'm on. Um, they, they, you can just leave it on your desk and they can pick it up and flip through. They're not flipping through your phone to see that. You know, that that's, that's the great power of, uh, of national drags are still. It's concrete. It's there. It can be shared and passed around. When we started this podcast, David, it was obviously to get more you know, attention on stock and super stock. And with that, I started interviewing stock and super stock racers at events. And every stock and super stock racer has a story. I mean, every single car you find in stock luminaire is going to have a great story behind it. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, we have multiple, multiple Vietnam veterans racing, class racing. Uh, I've told some of their stories. I've tried to interview those racers. I did notice that Joe Costello is going around now doing attention in the pits. Seems like he interviews a lot of stock and super stock racers. So <clears throat> at the national event at Maple Grove, I mean, the Fox camera crew came over to my, to my 65 Mustang. I was running two of them, stock and super stock. They went around the car two separate occasions. Not one of those made it to the, to the episode that day or whatever the, that the whole weekend i watched the coverage the whole weekend it's the first time i watched nhra coverage of an entire weekend because there's like multiple three-hour episodes N didn't make it okay but it was the same interviews of the same pro drivers constant all i did was fast forward fast forward mm -hmm. there has to be other people like me out there that are just fast forwarding to the last two minutes of an episode and just trying to find find the sportsman finals okay that's where Brian and I are saying, like, hey, how can we get a little bit more coverage? And before you even answer that, I want to add to that. Your Facebook page has 1.7 million followers. Uh, I've watched as many videos as I could find, and there's like a 20 million view Jet Dragster video. There's a 6.9 million view Funny Car blowing up. Okay, third place, 2.4 million views is John Gray versus John Shaw. 69 Camaro versus a 64 Plymouth heads up stock eliminator final round. When you guys put that on Facebook, it blew up. Okay. That's a classic heads up final right there. We run heads up multiple times throughout the year, class eliminations. I think you guys are missing a boat right there to, to use that to your advantage. And well, okay. yeah, I, no, I, think, I think, that, I, I think that you're right. And this is one of those eras that data has been helpful because that, that uh, final round it, it literally became the talk of, of NHRA headquarters and, and that understanding. And, and, and those views can't be denied, right? It's the type of thing that, you know, there are times where we made content that we thought was fantastic and we were very proud of, and people were more interested in watching a slow motion burnout uh, that we didn't have to do anything with. And it was the type of thing where that, you know, what the audience wants to see, Jet Dragsters, again, always surprises me how many views that it gets. Um, but in, in to your point, well, that's getting a lot of views because it's your main video. When you go onto the page, it's the main favorited video or whatever. So what, that one's going to get all the views. Like if what, you put this stock linear final up there, it would probably. Well, and, 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 uh, and I'm supporting your, your point, not, not, uh, not denying it. When we saw that, that stock linear final round, that became the type of information that NHRA couldn't deny um, and couldn't question because it was, it, it was obvious. And so it's the type of thing where uh, changes, I, I'm actually working with that piece right now and some others along, uh, along those lines to, to again, continue to further um, how we share that and, and how we, how we rely on, on those, those sports and racers final rounds. Again, I, I think it was not always obvious um, when, when, when production of TV show happens, uh, there are crews and it's a, it's a, it's a big production that they're live streaming effectively into a TV truck. And uh, in the case of people coming by with cameras, that is uh, fed uh, through our F radio frequency to the truck. And a ton of stuff is happening simultaneously. Um, and they cut a, a TV show out of it. And they cut it generally in the moment. Uh, but the idea of the final rounds and that footage, you know, we, we have that. And when we share it and have that type of success, that changes the way we do things. That changes our expectation for you know, can we hang our hat on 
uh, on on stock limit or racing the way again that that's what built that NHRA, right? I mean that final round um, is effectively ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty, fifty years ago, right? That that's what NHRA drag racing. That's what got us all excited about this, right? The idea of that heads up aspect. Um, it's all our hopes and dreams, and it and it's again it, it changed NHRA. So I think you're going to see some of that. You know now we're joking this is the the off season is the time where we get ready for a lot of the on season action um we'll have south georgia uh footage live streamed that is that is the t- first content that we will get from nhra and you're going to see us use sportsman content and leverage that sportsman content chop it up again the the camera angles and the um the production value um, of the fox tv show will allow us to show sports and racers in a great way you know that jib camera the same same people that are shooting uh, funny cars are now shooting sports and racers, and that was a great investment. Again, I don't I don't know if that was obvious to NHRA when they were doing it, but being able to use that as tool and show you in the best possible light it matters, and we'll continue to do so because it's like Gary under the curve. It's a torque curve. It's a horsepower curve. If 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 a, if a stock eliminator super stock racing can carry that kind of weight of views that that tells you the power of NHRA and, uh, and the idea of uh, there were pro racers talking about that final round, you know, there, there, there are opportunities that you know, you'll, you'll see us again, leveraging more um, that the difference between a pro and a sportsman uh, in today's day and age is really just about the story and the, and the connection. And again, these types of conversations weren't possible in a previous world. Again, this is your platform where we're able to connect and again, you're giving me the opportunity opportunity uh which is again i appreciate this too and this now works really well uh we'll we'll continue to share um you know footage content conversation Uh, we all want the same thing right we want to see you guys succeed want you to be able to race and giving you as much attention posing the best possible light um that's just good for us so i I just think there's a direct correlation between contingency or i should say between content and contingency the more content the more you know asses in the seats that are watching stock class eliminations on a Friday in front of a crowd instead of on a Thursday in front of zero people. I mean, when I started racing, which wasn't that long ago, we, we qualified on Thursday. We ran class on Friday in front of a lot of people. And then we ran first round of eliminations on Saturday in front of a lot of people. That's kind of gone. We, we we're running, we're qualifying Thursday morning, running class Thursday night and running first round Friday morning. So you might get that little bit of time in front of people, but now we're, we're bracket racing and not everybody in the stands really understands why this person left first, this person left second, why that person crossed the finish line first, but lost. Like I think heads up racing is, is anybody can appreciate that, especially when you have old muscle cars that are doing it. Yeah. Uh, so that's again, now we have the free NHRA channel on Roku TV. Anybody that has a Roku, I don't know if anybody knows this, but anybody that has a Roku, uh, I have streaming sticks uh, uh, hooked up to my uh, TVs there's a Roku live TV channel free go in there. NHRA has its own channel, which is great. It's showing a whole bunch of like races from the seventies and, and early days. I would love to see some stock and super stock racing in there though. I haven't seen any yet. Maybe I missed it, but any chance like we can get some in there, Dave. Yeah. So, and that's a good point. The historic content and, and a lot of that is, you know, digitized content that was on NHRA all access was, was uh, efforts Again, uh, by groups of people where you have an archive of information, but not not accessible to people if you didn't work at an NHRA. And so passing that through, uh, if you go and look online, and this this will be there if it's not there now, but you can even search, um, you know, just looking back at uh, a lot of super stock, stock racing from the 60s, uh, from the Hemi, from uh, the big block Chevy, from uh, Pontiac Super Duties, the idea of when uh, stockers were, were the investment center of automakers, and you saw a lot of changes. A lot of, they, they literally, NHRA uh, class racing created cars. You know, uh, you had Wally Parks in Detroit getting together and saying, you know, Wally, NHRA and Wally didn't create the muscle car, but it definitely gave it a platform to exist where there was a motivation to have big block Mustangs. Um, you know, Tasca family and, and Cobra Jet Mustang, you know, that, that was enough of a platform, just enough light, just enough attention that you could get a manufacturer to make a car. I think these are the same types of opportunities that we're seeing now, you know, with new cars. And again, it, we, we could, we go down some rabbit holes, but I, the idea of being able to see um, stock class racing, you know, categories and segments 
as a course of action, when I'm doing a national event, you'll see the Winter Nationals. The very first run of, of the Winter Nationals will be probably Stock Eliminator. And it's a type of thing that being able to see the first run of 2022 Winter Nationals and watch that round of qualifying its entirety and sharing it. You know, we I can clip it, share it, broadcast it, uh, com. And just as a course of action, that's what I'll do. And I can't do it with every category, every race day, because um, in reality, it just becomes a, a one-for-one time sink. But I think it's important to share through and then and then see which categories um, you know do people like most. And is it is it qualifying? Is it time trials? Um, is it, is it a final? There is some you know we have to be a little bit careful of some of the finals where if it's going to be on an entry on boxes program. Our agreements are such that we can't leak those things out before. But we're always right up against our our responsibilities as well as the opportunities. And um, again, I think that any heads up final is going to is going to do well for us, and you're going to see us share them. Um, anything with a good call, you know, good action. I can think back to uh, one of the things that caused a lot of uh, sports and racing to make it and caused it to make it an NHRA's uh, national dragster uh, in the video content. Um, it was a call. It was, again, Cobra Jets, uh, Cobra Jet versus a Mustang. Excuse me, Cobra Jet versus a Copo car. And just the the tension that exists, because these are real cars with real people and real stories. These are, these are totally different philosophies being uh, waging war against each other. That's what stock limit and super stock racing represents. It's not, we call it class racing because it's, it's minutia within the class, but it's, it's not one kind of car, right? These are all different philosophies all coming out. And that's, that's inherently, again, as a car guy, different engine, different power combination, different chassis. There's a lot to enjoy there because you're seeing differences. Um, you see evolutions. Uh, another variety, time I can tell, variety, I can tell a story about it. Yeah. You know, a stock limit car that we intended to do something with and, it was so much quicker than we were originally thinking that uh, this grand plan that we had with another auto manufacturer, it all fell apart because this car from the sixties was quicker than their car that they were just debuting. And it was just, and, and then they came and said, well, after 50 years of refinement, of course, it's going to be fast. You know, of course it's going to be fast, but you know, again, these are, these are good opportunities and you'll see us also in the, in the auto manufacturer world, you know, what they, what they want to sell is much more akin to the stop, uh, super stock type of car and again these are great opportunities for you know look dodge they had hellcat they had demon and then they had the, uh, the challenger super stock car and i don't know how much traction they got with that but you you saw um you saw them literally name that car um <clears throat> again just things that couldn't have happened 10 20 years ago are now all of a sudden possible so let's take advantage of it and uh, let's 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 commit to shining a bright light on continue these conversations continue to see clips of of, of all kinds of racing and then make sure that when you have success with metrics and views, that that is a story that is told and retold and shared again and again. Um, because we can't have we can't have a success in our own sphere. We got to have a success that everybody's aware of. You know, it's oh, we have we possible. have three thousand followers on this Facebook page for Class Racing today. I posted a video of actually a friend of mine running a super stock nineteen seventy two Maverick doing a wheelie, going almost going over backwards. The crazy yep. bastard, and it's got 170,000 views right now on our little 3,000 followed page. So again, I'm just, can you petition the Fox? Can we get more TV time? How does how what does stock and super stock have to do to get on TV? Well, I, I think that run you're talking about made it to TV because of um, because of the the data that comes along with it, and I think our localized success. You know, again, it was that type of business is driven by metrics and perception. And now that you have more data to provide them, you know, we, we can't argue with that. So I, I think that's that's part of the transition. Um, you know, there are some assumptions that for a long time, uh, even what a what a pro was, you know, and what a pro category is, is kind of becoming a fluid thing where you know your effort and a professional effort is not based on the type of car you're running. Um, you know, they are, but it, it's based on your internal effort and your commitment and your strategy, right? So I, I think those are things that have blurred those lines and, and that's becoming uh, more obvious. But again, from a Fox standpoint, um, that that is changing based on the data of what you've seen. You've, you've seen them reconsider some categories and uh, some efforts, um, what TV shows they do, how they share that information. In some cases, uh, what we're allowed to live stream, um, it, it's moving in the right directions. and. And they will go where the success is 
because they want to have it too. You know, they need to have it as well. So I, I would expect to see more uh, sports and racing uh, in every platform and, and, and including, um, you know, with the Fox broadcast because it's just, it's just such an important part and a vibrant part of, uh, of motorsports right now. Ford, Dodge, and Chevy, Toyota, um, it's the only place they, they all can compete. Well, not to sound like the new sensitive generation, but I think we should just get rid of the term pro because I would rather hang out with the Emmons family than the Force family any day of the week. So, <laughs> well, and, and that's something that, you know, for, for a lot of people coming to NHRA races and coming from the car person world, they don't realize you can come to the pits and the difference, you know, the environment in an NHRA race where you can have access to, you know, guys that have been doing this forever and have understanding and have a conversation. It's like a clinic, it's a social setting. Again, as come from the West Coast, coming to any race, the first time I'm there, it's hard for me to leave before one o'clock in the morning because of the time change and the idea of the conversations and the camaraderie and the community that's happening in the pits. Um, and it's the type of thing where that kind of access, I don't think everybody, that's another story that we were working on telling, you know, the people that are there, that the like-minded enjoyment, um, the friends that you have never met, but you have so much in common with, uh, that you're going to click with them. And it's not, and it's not just the big family names that, you know, it's, it's a lot of other names and a lot of the people who give them a chance, uh, you're going to join them. You're going to, you're going to connect with them. Wow. And, uh, and there's so many of them that's never, you're never going to run out of people to have uh, a good time with there. The hospitality um, of the Holtz or any of those, you could stop by any trailer at any divisional event with the stock super stock car and the, the, uh, hospitality tents or the food and the drinks that they serve are just as good as any hot dog you're going to eat at the pro side. Uh, it, and, and you're right. And, and, it, and I'll tell you, it, it goes even farther, uh, this year, uh, winter nationals that happened in summer, I was taking some photos in the motorhome section uh at the grandstands and i'm not not known by any of these people but the hospitality they, they said you know you, what are you doing i'm taking pictures and do you need anything to drink it's hot you know it's summer do you what do you need and the idea of you need to have any lunch and again the 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 humanity and the good time the camaraderie you're, you're right it's it's not based on budgets um it's based on uh, the generosity and and people's just true enjoyment if you go to an hra race and you enjoy it, you share that enjoyment with other people. If you're miserable and you're struggling, um, you also share that. So the idea of the people that are enjoying themselves the most, those are the people that are going to have um, the best time with. And again, I, that, that's the part that, um, that I've really enjoyed is, uh, is going down. Again, pro-level pits are, are accessible. Sports and level pits, uh, you just got to be careful. You're not going to be called into into action to help you know, um, at some point. But again, even that's great, too. You know, they can learn. And uh, so many people will come up to me and say, how do I get a job in drag racing? And I said, well, the, the best way is, is find the race closest to you and go to it because there is a need, there is a want. There are people there you're going to connect with and it may not come with a paycheck the first day you're there, but you, if you want to get involved, plug yourself in because there is a fit there for you um, and it's your opportunity to find it. I want to, I want to, I guess, just reach out and thank you for coming on and, letting us letting us pound on you a little bit research it was just uh it was awesome to get a little diver, deeper dive in and i think it really clarified a lot of things so thank you so much for i can't thank you guys enough for the opportunity from uh, nhra because again this is a good story and i think it got muddied and murky to the point where people assumed it wasn't a good story it's still a great story and uh and again sharing your audience um sharing this process you know the idea of you as a racer Take that form when you're in the winner circle, either winner or runner up, make your claim, make, make authentic claims, you know, claim stuff that you have in the car. It's the one time where the tech department, you know, you and the tech department, there's, there's no adversarial role here. They want you to get paid too. And again, they have to be legitimate claims because if, if an illegitimate claim is made, we got to filter it out because illegitimate claims are bad for the program. Uh, illegitimate claims to get passed to a manufacturer uh, only weaken the program and cause manufacturers to exit. So we only scrutinize these claims to make sure we're, we're passing through legitimate ones. If we screw up, again, dkennedy at entry.com, contingency at entry.com. Uh, I'll give you my cell phone number to anybody that wants it. Bobby, I'll give it to you if you want to pass it on to anybody else. The only risk you have there is you're going to talk to me for 35, 45 minutes. And I'm going to enjoy it. 
and, and you're going to get a solution, but it's going to be, uh, I'm going to enjoy it more than you are. It's the type of thing that pass through those claims, making sure that you get the checks, making sure we have the right contingency partners at the corporate level who understand how to take advantage of, of this great marketplace uh, of the great sports and racers and, uh, and see this as the opportunity to sell more products and do the things they love too. So again, it's, it's a win-win. Um, let's have a great 2022. This is an opportunity to, to get more money and more success uh, at more events than, than we've had in a long time. So let's, let's take it out and see what we can do with it. All right, David. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And like you said, right, uh, we'll get two hours of coverage on the next Fox broadcast. Two and a half. You did say that, right? Two, two and, and a half. half. All right. Thank you. Uh, no, we, we really appreciate you coming on. And yeah, it's been educational and amazing. So have a good one. Everybody, it's 2 two twenty two today. We didn't cover that. There. Happy uh, Groundhog Day, too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do this. Let's do this again tomorrow. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll, we'll start with that 2 2 2 2 thing in the, uh, earlier on. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, David. It's awesome that you would take the time and uh, come on the show and expand. So thank you very much um, for doing that. ClassRacingToday.com is the website. Uh, also, you, remember that you can donate to help support the show. Um, if you want to do some strange number things, you could utilize that 2222 product and uh, make a donation around that number if you want to. Anyway, thanks a lot so much, uh, Brian and Bobby. Have a great week. ClassRacingToday at gmail.com if you have any questions or comments. Uh, otherwise, thanks for listening. Have a wonderful day. We will see you on the next one. See ya.